but like getting back out here and getting really rolling with the fall now. It, it's a pretty big thrill. I mean, you go all summer long, kind of grinding on the road, watching guys that you hope to coach in the future and it's exciting, but eventually you kind of long for being around the guys that you get really close with, kind of your family, or at least your second family, and that would be the returning guys, and the incoming guys, are they're in the inner circle now, but we're still getting to know them, and the returning players are still getting to know those guys, but it, it's been a smooth process to this point, but I think everyone's anxious to play. We've been doing group practice for a while now and breaking things down, but I think everyone wants to go out and see what they can do, and, and we want to see what they can do. What needs to be accomplished over these next couple of weeks? Well, I, step one is to prepare. In 10 days, we play Clemson on this field. And, um, you know, it's an ACC team. It's a, it's a program with a rich history, and I assume I haven't done any research. I assume they're loaded up this year uh, just as they often are. So it's going to be a pretty big challenge right out of the gate for our group. And then it's a huge challenge for both programs because we're very early into the fall. So um, don't want to lower our standards, but I'm willing to expect it's going to be a little sloppier than both coaching staffs would like. But then that allows us to reset and kind of get our guys' attention for the things we do need to accomplish before we play that second date that the NCAA allows. So kind of breaking it into pieces. And that first one would be the Clemson game. Tony, in terms of new guys, is this an unusually high number or is this maybe typical based on your experiences when you're kind of building building a program? Yeah, I think this is the kind of the final wave of, of basically trying to create our own roster, take ownership of the whole deal, make sure we have enough of what we think is important, uh, kind of balance out the left-handed, right-handed pitching, all those things. And um, you guys are smart enough to know, followed our team last year, there's a lot of staples that are not around. Uh, guys like Andre J. Ammo, some of the pitching too, uh, those guys were here for three years, contributed for three years, and now they left a big void. Uh, but I think there's an awful lot of talent to, to fill those those voids. And in some cases, it's going to take a few guys. You know, no one's going to steal as many bases as Jay Charleston. Uh, but we've brought in a couple guys. We bring back a few guys that could maybe each contribute to get close to that big number. How does that change the challenge for you as a coach when you've got this, this many new guys in in terms of putting a team together and also... I guess finding roles or determining what who does what well and things like that. It, it makes it fun because there are there are vacancies. That's why those guys are here. I mean, uh, I think you got to recruit with a purpose, and our our kind of purpose has changed from this point forward. But when we first got here, it was kind of accumulate a lot of things, and and you're seeing the the fruits of that labor, so to speak, out on the field with a lot of talent in quality and quantity, and it means competition in all those spots that are open. So it should be a lot of fun. But I don't. I don't think it's actually more difficult on the coaching staff with all the newcomers uh, because the returning guys now know what to expect from us. And they've kind of handled things really professionally with that incoming group and have kind of mentored them and turned it into almost a big brother program, which when you got a really good team, which we're, we're a long way from being able to say we've done that, but that's kind of what you got going on is, is the older guys take those younger guys under their wing. and. That doesn't mean one of those younger guys can't steal some innings or, or take a job from one of those, you know, quote unquote mentors. As the, the, the head coach, how does the, the coaching style change when you go from building a program that hadn't been to the postseason in a while to finally getting to the postseason and now you're in that offseason where you're trying to get back? How does that change with the, the standards and the expectations? I, I think the things that you wake up and you, you take a shower and you're getting dressed, all those things stay the same. You know, what can you do to quote unquote win the day or any of those other cliches that I think are good to read to kind of keep you focused. Um, so you got to stay on task and on, you know, on a mission for what you want to do as an individual, whether you're a coach or a player. But what changes is those externalities. And I talked with John Wilkerson earlier today for a guy like Alaric or Garrett Crochet, it's, hey, earn the right to be a Tennessee ball, to be a name in the SEC, all those things, a full time contributor and then it kind of flips on you, the script a little bit. Now it's can you wipe away the externals or ignore some of that stuff that comes with either the draft or getting interviewed by you guys more. Um, so there's a parallel there for us as a coaching staff. Now our guys have been to the postseason. They expect to, they want to go back. So I don't think we change our mission every day, but there are some externalities that either need to be handled or ignored, and that's up to us. And ultimately up to Frank, he's the wisest one on how to handle all that stuff. Sometimes it's crap and sometimes it's good stuff, but uh, we got to navigate through that a little bit, just like we navigated through, you know, different challenges our first couple years. How do you challenge Garrett Crochet to, to kind of establish himself as the guy that you know he can be? Well, I think our best team is with him being 
on, on Friday nights. Uh, the bullpens have been pretty good. Now, they're bullpens and no one's standing in, so he's a long way from earning that, you know, that role. And I haven't said any of this stuff to him, so I don't know if he'll hear this, but that's kind of my gut instinct, just being honest with you. Um, but there, there may be uh, a rotation in our mind that the best combination is, is maybe this, that, or the other. It may be different. Um, so, again, kind of sticking to the, the theme of control what you can control. He needs to go out there and do what he's done in the past, but it should be a little bit more mature. The emotion should be in check a little bit better. The strike throwing has been there, but it should be even a little bit higher percentage. So he definitely doesn't need to change who he is, but you got to grow up, man. You'd like to be, as a junior, a little bit more of a complete player in person than you were as a sophomore. And, you know, whatever age you are, keep, keep developing. Um, if you're not growing in this game, you're, you're probably getting asked to leave it. Um, so he needs to do that this year, but he needs to do it for the rest of his career, which I think is going to be pretty long. Do you have any idea of incoming guys that you expect to lean on a little bit more than? You know, Jordan Beck is a kid with a bat that's been very impressive um, in his days coming up to here, but also being here. Um, he's physical enough to play right away, and he's he's got a good mentality, and, and he's a worker. He kind of fits what we're looking for, and uh, that's the first instinct on the offensive side. Uh, would love for somebody that didn't hear their name to leapfrog him. Uh, but Drew Gilbert is, is one on the on the mound that I think would be exciting for you guys to watch just because he's so animated and high energy uh, to the point where, you know, we might have to sit down and talk at some point. But you like that in, in a guy. And, you know, he's a, a late addition to us. So he's got a cool little backstory uh, to us that maybe one of you guys will write about at some point. He was supposed to go to Oregon State. And was a late add on here and he's left-handed and uh, he's got the stuff to pitch in the SEC right away so he's one of the first instinct guys that come to mind and um, there's a couple guys that are banged up that won't be able to play this year it's disappointing because I think coach Elander did a great job of bringing those two guys in uh, and then there's a big old sandwich between you know those two guys and the two that I just mentioned so it, it'll be fun in the fall. Did Ortega and who else? And Gilo they're both summer teammates and one's a left-handed pitcher one is a guy who's a position player those guys would have maybe been on the tip of my tongue to answer that question, but uh, they're not in the mix. And, you know, every time a man goes down, a, a man steps up if, if you got a good program or you got a good team in that particular year. Does Gilbert have Garrett Crochet type energy on the mound when, when you're talking about him? It's different. It's a little more spazzy, um, if, if uh, that's acceptable to say. And I think if our, the team was here, they would all shake their head yes and agree with me. Uh, but it's because he has a passion for what he's doing, and he's got a system that works for him. And, and Garrett Crochet is still going through, what is my best personality? How do I show up on game day? How do I react to good and bad? And, and that's part of growing as a player. And again, if you're really good, you know, like JP was, you don't figure it out till you're 25, 26. Um, and, and, you know, Gilbert's just a freshman, as are these other freshmen. So they're going to find out some of the stuff they did in high school works here. And some of it they're going to need to tinker with. And that's why we need to play these innings to just give them reps and let them figure it out for themselves, but also observe as coaches and, you know, address those issues when the fall is over or even in the middle of the fall. Do you have a sense where Camden is in your pitching mix right now? He's pretty good. Um, and, and I think um, he's another guy that, you know, if, you, if you're a competitor, you want to be the Friday night starter. And, again, that doesn't always mean – you're the number one or, or you got beat out if you're not on Friday in particular. Uh, but he's one of those guys that could vie for that spot, not just this year, but also next year in his junior year. Um, but he looks bigger. He looks thicker, even though he's still lean. Um, you don't want, he don't want you to call him skinny anymore. Uh, but he's another high energy guy that I think as the year went on, he realized what not to say, not what not to react to and, and some other things too that, you know, have caused him to develop. And I think, He'll be like he was last year. He'll be good, but he's going to be better. Okay, you got some uh, work at third base this summer. Is that with the lack of experience there? Is that somewhere he can help build this year? Probably not. You know, the guys that, that stick out at third, I, I kind of went on that rant last year and mentioned Trey Lipscomb is, is someone we really love over at, their, at the corner because it's so difficult to play defensively. Um, but Austin Knight is a guy who was kind of hidden uh, because we had some decent bats last year in the lineup, and he can really hit. He needs to prove that he can play that position. He was a shortstop. Um, you know, in high school. And then Jordan Beck is a fun X factor for us. He's a really good athlete. He was a really good basketball player. And the Red Sox drafted him. They actually worked him out at third base. So he's worked out at third base for us as well. And those have kind of been the most, the three most popular names. Uh, but I got a couple in the back of my mind that we're going to try over there in scrimmages, and there may be somebody else. So 
it's it's stressful if you got that hole and you don't have options. Uh, I'd like to think we have some good options. Are you excited well, about Heflin and the, the summer he put together? Yeah, I'm just excited about the end of the year meeting I had with Heflin. And first of all, it gave me like a great answer to media questions and then a common theme with recruits on the phone. Will was a kid who wanted to come in and change the program as a, a diehard Vol fan, an in-state kid, local player, and it, it didn't look like that was going to happen. And then all of a sudden it did, and it gives him a lot of pride in this place more so than, than maybe some others. And then too, he, he sat down and said, I can't believe we missed out on that my first two years. That was so fun. And now I just want to do it again. And, and when we do it again, I want to win. And you know, that's what every college baseball player is saying right now is I want to go to Omaha, which you got to win a regional to do that. But you could you could feel it, you could almost smell it or coming off them. I don't know if that's the right word. I guess you'd need to take a shower if that was the case. But you, you, you could just see it kind of oozing out of him that you know, he had that passion for that regional environment and he did great in it. And so it's gonna be fun to watch him pitch, but also lead because he's got that kind of savvy and has that backstory that, you know, tried to explain to you. What would you say to fans out there who, after last year, you know, expectations a little bit higher now making the postseason, what would you say to the, the fans out there who maybe their expectations are a little bit higher for this program and this team this year? Well, I, I think each year is mutually exclusive and, um, you know, they're smart enough to know we lost some pieces, but if you're competitive in the SEC, 10 teams went to a regional, um, you know, you'd like to think you could finish in the top half every year or at least compete for it. I mean, we don't get too specific with exact standards yet. We're still kind of scrapping. And I think our fans need to be on board with that approach of where we're at in this program is we still need to scrap for some dollars to improve this facility. We need to grind like crazy on the road to catch up in recruiting and really be satisfied with our rosters. Um, and the same goes for out here. Um, it should be a scrappy bunch that's fighting to get back to the postseason. But I think, if anything, there should be a little bit more of a fire ignited to the fans to follow, hopefully come out in person. Um, and then there, there's some good draws there for them to come see. I mean, a couple potential first-rounders, uh, some definite big leaguers on the roster, and then some guys that are local guys that have helped turn the program around and made Tennessee fans happy to walk around or just follow baseball scores. Last season before the season started, you described the lineup as being versatile. That's what you expected from the lineup. I know it's super early, but how would you describe the lineup kind of going in middle fall ball? Boring answer, but the truthful, the same. Versatile, I mean, I, I think we have a couple more left-handed hitters. Um, I think you could be looking at an outfield situation where we use six guys. I mean, it's really early, um, but you could use a few different DHs this year. I think there's more depth. Um, but there is a little bit of a question who's going to fill, you know, the crazy man that played third base for us last year, who's going to fill his shoes or, you know, replace his numbers. And again, it's like Jay's stolen bases. No one necessarily needs to replace those because again, this mutually exclusive, it's a new group. We need to create our own identity. Uh, but I think again, it's going to be versatile. You know, we do have a lot of guys back from when I made that comment. There's some guys that can run. Um, there's guys who do different things and it's going to be up to us as a coaching staff to kind of, you know, make it a melting pot of a lot of positives that can score enough to help what I think will be another pitching and defense type, you know, orientated team. Take one more, guys. What are you saying to a guy like Alaric, who is production-wise one of your best returning players with Ammo and Jay and, and Andre uh, obviously going to the MLB? Go to class and get good grades, <laughs> <laughs> which, which he's done. And he's kind of gone out of his way to try and take on a leadership role this year, which has been cool to see. Um, so there are things as you do grow, kind of like I mentioned with Garrett, that you get a little bit better at, or you maybe take more responsibility. Um, but he's been a good student since he's been here. He's been a really good hitter. He was a gold glove defender for most of the year up until the last few games. Um, so to continue to do what you do, stay true to your roots. And I mean, I listen to some rap music, but these guys know better than I, whatever, do, do what you do or whatever the phrases are that fall <laughs> under that, you know, uh, not Mountain Dew, do the do, but, uh, you know, kind of stay true to your roots. If you, if you try and do too much, that brings about the biggest problems that baseball players have. And, uh, so maybe that'll be up to us, but also him to, to make sure he stays within.